morning's uh, Old Testament lesson is taken from Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I am redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. New Testament lesson is uh, 1 Peter 5, verses 1 to 7. To the elders among you, I feel I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve not lording it over those who can trust it to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I don't know how they do that, getting back and forth like that. <laughs> Wouldn't be my jam, as they say. Um, good, I'm Andrea Katz. So nice to be with you. Um, a little bit about me. I am, I was a member of Christ Church for over 10 years. Um, and now I am the welcoming coordinator at Carlisle UMC Church. And so I worship with them every morning, and they're on their own today. So hopefully they're nice to all the new people, so, which they will be. Um, I was so happy to be asked to come and share with you. Let us, and I, again, apologize for my lateness. Let's begin uh, with some prayer. Gracious God, thank you for this opportunity to meet you here. I pray that my words will bring you glory. Open our hearts, God, so we feel your presence here today. In your name we pray. So I'm a chaplain. I'm a chaplain mm -hmm. at a hospital. I'm currently at UPMC Carlisle. Brand new for me. Been there less than a month. Prior to that, I was a emergency department chaplain at Meredith's Medical Center, which is a trauma center. What that means is that I have, the, I have the greatest privilege in the world to walk beside people on what might be the hardest days of their lives. I hear every day and have learned more and more that God is good. God is good all the time, right? As all the time he is good. As Methodist, we know that and we feel it, but I also know that God is good and still some days are hard. Some days are really hard. We need to give ourselves permission as people, as Christians, as church to admit that some days are hard. Hard could be grief, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about has to do with that. But, but hard could be losing a job. 
It could be a dear friend moving away. A hard time could be that you always felt God's presence. And now you're in a dry spell. Many Christians tell me that they feel guilt to admit that they're having a hard time. I think this guilt comes from knowing that you are, knowing that you're that whatever the reason is, is that God is in control, and that if the person, if you are experiencing grief, that the person, their salvation was sure, especially if you knew their salvation was sure, you feel guilt, right? Like, but they're okay. They're in, they're where they want to be. But what we all know as humans is where we want our people to be is right here. We want them right here. And that it is okay to acknowledge that. It is okay. I believe the scriptures tell us that we will have difficult times. It's not a bed of roses. I also believe that the scriptures help us to see how it is okay to be a human share those things. I hope it also, I am able to share with you in this short talk today that it's okay to share your emotions. I'm hoping to share three coping techniques to use when times are hard. I also want to hopefully show you that Jesus used a lot of these techniques. Uh, Carlisle UMC's motto, and everybody has it on their bumper sticker, is live like Jesus. So, let's, live like, let's try to live like Jesus. I also want to share with you what this sermon will not be. I will not be using Romans 8, 28, which is, and we all know that in all things God works for good for those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. I won't be using that. And I ask you, please, please, take it away from your wheelhouse. Right? You're getting ready to, someone has a tragedy, someone's having a hard time, you sit down, you're going to write them a note. And that's the verse you go to. We all have done it, but let's get rid of it. That's the long game. That's the years, months, decades later, you can have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea with somebody and they can tell you the long game. But being with people in the moment, it only hurts. It's not showing empathy. It's not living like Jesus. It's not loving. I often think when I think of this verse, I think of grieving parents. Grieving parents who have done amazing things. I don't know if many of you know Marcy Taylor, who runs the Grief Center here in Shippen's Park. Her long game has been amazing. But she's not a martyr. And she would have told you that she wished she never had this long game. Right. So, take that out of your breath. So the first coping technique that I'd like to share with you is sharing your emotions. How many of us, and you don't have to raise your hand, Christ Church they did, but you don't have to raise your hand, they know me, right? How many of you have been sitting with somebody who's crying and then you said, okay, you're okay, which is code for stop crying now, right? So many of us have done it. I often, when I hear, think of this, I think of my son Russell, who is now a senior. Oh, hard to believe. He's now a senior when he was four or five. We had just, we live on a farm right by Beanie's, right at the bend. And um, our cat had gotten out. They'd been indoor out, got that, got out, got hit by a car, and she died. 
and I'm taking care of her, and he's with me, and he says, Mommy, it's okay to cry. Well, I ugly cried, right? <laughs> Everywhere, right? Everywhere, it was ugly crying. About five minutes later, he goes, you can stop now. <laughs> and, and that was okay, I'm mom, right? That was okay for me to pull it together. But we need to do better. We need to be okay with people sharing in their emotions. Jesus wept. Jesus wept when Mary and Martha wept. He probably knew how the story was going to end. Right? But he wept because of the pain that Mary and Martha were experiencing because of Lazarus. He wept because of their sadness. No one said, Jesus, it's time to stop now. So it's okay to share your emotions. It's okay to share them with God. I also want to bring up anxiety, right? We're talking about, it's even in, I didn't even know this when I, I see that, cast all your anxieties on him. He cares for you. Didn't know it was going to be on the cover. I love it. I absolutely love it. When I was the ED chaplain at Meredith, every single day, so I would walk into rooms. So this would be in between big traumas. I would just go in. Someone would be there for like a sore foot or staples or something. You know, they had an emergency, but it's just a little emergency. And I would go and knock on the door and say, hi. And they'd see my big name tag that says chaplain, and they would say, Go help somebody else. I have anxiety and I have this and I have that and your people have made me feel bad. So what I say to them is, I'm sorry my people made you feel bad. We suck sometimes. It's the truth, right? Right? And what I know is that it's okay to have anxiety. Can I sit down and talk a little bit? And when you say suck when you're a chaplain, people go, oh, you must be like not at all pious. Sit down, right? So I sit down. And I hear those stories. And if it's okay, I then say, God says to give us your anxiety. He doesn't say give it once. And Peter tells us in this, care for those who have anxiety. Care for those who have worries. Care for those who are having difficult times. And care for yourself too. But you're allowed to have anxiety over and over and over and over again. It's on a one and go. So, First coping is express your emotions. The second is, during a difficult time, focus on what you can control. Clarissa Mall is a blogger. If you ever have a chance to listen to any of her podcasts, she's amazing. She's a mother. She's a widow. She's a widow. Of her, her husband's name was Rob. He actually wrote one of um, the best books on dying. And it's called The Art of Dying. He was a, a hospice chaplain. He worked for the Christian Times. He and Clarissa and their four children were camping. She was going to finish up. And they had been there for a long time. I think it was Oregon. And they had been there a few weeks. She's like, the kids are still sleeping. I'm going to finish camp packing up. We'll leave when you go back. Go take a short hike. And Rob never came home. He fell hiking. And Clarissa in her blog about grief talks about in the early days of her grief, meaning the weeks, the months, she took care of the little tiny things. She has a, had a huge group of people who were able to help her um, handle the big things. She learned she didn't know how to drive the camper. Right? And, and my wife and I camp, and I have to tell you, that um, 
after this happened, I know how to drive the camper. I know how to pull the camper down. I can pull it straight. If there's ever an emergency, I can hitch it up and I can drive it somewhere, no reversing. That's what I can control, right? If there's an emergency, Judy can't drive, I can drive straight somewhere. Hopefully not need any gas. That just sounds really scary. <laughs> but Clarissa tells us about doing the things we can control. In the beginning, she could control one or two things a day. She could control that she could get up every evening and bathe her children. A couple of them were really little. That's all she did in the beginning. And she also talks in her book, Beyond Darkness, um, about Psalm 34. And she talks about the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And save those who have crushed spirits. Hmm. Right? We, all, we all have had crushed spirits, even for the last afternoon morning season. He is with us. Clarissa shares that she received a card about six months after Rod's death. And all it was was Psalm 43 verses 1 and 2. And at that time she was starting to experience little moments of joy. She was experiencing some of her children's milestones, and she was happy for moments. And she realized then that even though she had this horrible thing happen to her, she wasn't all burned up, that the river didn't wash her away, that part of her was still there, and that's what she got to control of. So often with grief, experts use stages, experts use circles, everybody's trying to reinvent the wheel, right? Clarissa talks about waves, and I love this analogy. My dad loved the ocean. I grew up in Philadelphia, and we went to the beach for weeks every summer. My dad was a Philadelphia cop, so he wanted to get his, all his kids out of the city, right? Get his five kids out of the city. So we would often go camping and go to the beach. And my dad loved the ocean. And my dad would take us out. Sometimes it would be really far out. And he taught us the two things, or taught me, or I guess my siblings too, I don't know, taught us the things you need to know when you're out in the ocean. Some ways you jump, and you let them crash over you, and you feel all that power. In some ways, you do what? Anybody know? What else? You go under, you go under. And that is how coping during difficult times, what that's like. Sometimes you have to, cr you crash through it, and you feel every single emotion. I say often, um, about grief, so this past June, my mother passed. I thought I knew grief. I thought I knew pain. I was so wrong. I was at the grocery store, and I'm going to buy bananas, and if you've tried to buy bananas lately, it's not easy. They look like they either are so green that they'll never turn yellow, or they look like someone brought them here and danced on them. And I'm in the banana produce aisle of Aldi, and for a moment, I felt, I don't know why the bananas made me do it, but I all of a sudden felt this incredible sense of grief and pain. I chose not, I chose to dive under at that moment and just go, oh, okay. And I dove under when I bought my bananas, and I didn't weep at Aldi. People think I'm weird enough as it is, right? Like, you don't need to be crying at Aldi. But there's other times that you just crash through it. A friend of mine is a teacher, and she said every single parent-teacher meeting, someone brings up their grief. Someone brings up their difficult times. So I often, she often talks to me right before parent-teacher meetings for 
tips on how to help people. The tip is be nice. That's all there really is. But what Clarissa reminds us of and what First Peter, which is really an underused book, um, what First Peter reminds us of is that we will not be completely swept away. The last technique is self-care. Everybody's self-care is different, okay? I swim. I swam when I was a teen and I started swimming again. I started swimming to lose weight. I lost a bunch of weight, got a bunch more to go, but I swim. Of course, when I started swimming, like all of us, didn't know COVID was gonna happen, right? And as a chaplain, I have stuff in my head. It's not my stuff that I need to get rid of. So my self-care is swimming. I swim laps after laps after laps after laps. All I do when I'm swimming is count the lap. My self-care is not only the swimming, that it's good for my body and my soul and my spirit and everything. I dive under that water and I really feel anew. But I also have to remember to count because sometimes I think, oh, was I on three or was I on four? I better say three because what if I was on four? Or what, whatever, I should, call, I should take the lower number, is what I always tell myself. And I wind up swimming a lot more, right? Because I don't want to be like, not enough. And these, the swimming has become amazing um, for me physically, like I said. But the other thing is, I was late to Facebook, only in the last couple of years I came to Facebook. And I do pool thoughts. Whenever I have something really awesome happen at the pool, I do pool thoughts. This past week, I asked an instructor at the Carlisle Y to teach me how to do breaststroke. I had forgotten how. I don't know why I forgot, I forgot how. I still could do my, my backstroke and my freestyle. I was kicking it, right? But I wanted to remember how to do breaststroke. The reason I forgot it is because it's hard. Right? So here I am in the pool and she's giving me all these instructions and I start laughing at her because she tells me, okay, you do this thing with your legs, it's like four things, but with your arms, you pray, then you glide. I'm like, huh, I can maybe be better at that. So my pool thoughts this week was talking about my lesson, how hard it was, and the parts of me hurt I didn't know I owned, and then to pray and glide. And that's my self-care, but everybody's self-care looks different. And it's okay if your self-care changes. But what I tell you is when things are good, even if it's a moment of good, find what that self-care is. When I was at Meredith, I used to do programs, I'm sorry, so, it, um, and when I was at Marinus in Hagerstown, we used to do grief programs uh, with the community. And I had this boy say, when I was talking about that, I like to go out in nature. Well, I should have known better. Grew up in the city. He goes, does the pot, the tomato pot on my back porch count? Because that's his only nature, right? And I'm like, yeah, that works for you, but maybe just find something else that works for you. And he thought, he thought, he thought. He said, you know what? Dribbling my basketball makes me feel better. That's a good idea, right? Uh, 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 uh. That was his self-care. So just think about what your own self-care is. And the last thing about self-care is finding gratitude. We talk so much now about gratitude, and the reason we talk about it is because it's important and it's real. So this morning, I got up, and I was grateful that the dogs were still asleep. Some days, that's all I got. Right? But I said it out loud, quietly, so they didn't wake up. 
I got to go take my shower, I got to do my get dressed, and then they were awake and we, I took them out. The mornings that they're up and they need to go before I am, sort of messes me up, right? So I was thankful for them. And some of these grateful things are big and some are little, but start each day with gratitude. Find that one little thing, like the dogs didn't wake up before you did. And this may be weird for some of you. It's not weird for me, because I really, really like to talk, but say it out loud. Even if there's no one listening, even if there's no human listening next to you, say it out loud. I'm thankful for this cup of coffee. I'm thankful for this friend. Whatever that thing is, thankful that my eyes are open and I can sit and see the beauty. Whatever it is, Say it out loud. When I was in my early 20s, Judy and I worshipped with the uh, Chamberford Quaker meeting. And we worshipped with them for over 10 years until we attended the New Year's Eve event at um, Christ Church. And Russell, who was four at the time, I think, said, why don't we worship with these people? They're really nice and it's not as far. So that's how my adventure into United Methodist happened. But the Quakers are still very much close to my heart. And the Quakers say, hold, holding someone in the light, it comes from John, that God is light. And he says about holding, it says about holding someone in the light. So that is their version of prayer. It's prayer, they just call it holding in the light. But what I think is really important about the Quakers is they remind each other to hold themselves in the light. That's heavy, right? We're used to doing it for others. But when days are hard, you need to hold yourself in the light and ask God to be present. So I ask you to try to remember to hold yourself in the light and others in the light. Amen. response today is trust in the bag. So if you're able to stand and join the others in
sure if I lead this or not. So let us go in prayer, silent prayer, and share those things on your heart. Share those things that you feel you can't say out loud. Let's take that to Jesus. So the prayers of the church I see a long list of, by the way, I love lambs when it says lambs. I love when church do that. When they have limited access members, it's just my favorite thing. Um, so I see lots of those on the list, lots of names of folks I don't know, so I don't know the story. Um, I know that Pastor John's family were keeping them in prayer. Any other prayer requests today? Amazing, thank you for sharing that. Jane, you said, Yep, Jane Hughes. That's amazing. I ask you to hold um, my friend's baby, Griffin. He's having a little couple little issues, but keep him in your in your prayers. I have an update on Sue Morrow. Okay, uh, she had a severe eye injury and had lots of pressure and trauma to her eye. But she was able to come home early morning following that, and uh, we're just praying that uh, she doesn't lose vision. Mm -hmm. All right. I have a praise. Okay. Um, there's a young man, Forrest Ryan. He uh, grew up playing Little League midget football with Julie's son, Brock. And uh, he went and had a nice career at Villanova. And as every boy's dream to play football, he didn't get drafted, but he got signed as a free agent with the uh, Colts, which is amazing. And he actually had nine tackles in their scrimmage in their preseason game last night. So he's a rookie free agent trying to beat the odds and make the team. And uh, it's, it's just a praise to how how God works for people. Great, that's awesome. Hope you see. That's good for him. Good for him that he didn't give up, right? Yes. Lord of praise. Lord of praise. Let us pray. Gracious God, you know our burdens and our worries before we bring them. But you tell us that when we call you by name, we are to leave them at your feet. We ask God that you be with all the lambs. We ask that you be with Pastor John's family at this time. We ask you to be tomorrow. I don't remember the first name. Sue. Sue. I'm sorry. I should have written it down. I ask you to be with Sue as she heals from her eye injury. May you provide her with comfort and may she have minimal pain. God, we are so thankful for Jane Hughes' recovery. I'm sure it's ongoing, but as we all know, it's only your seasons, only your time. I ask that you reveal to us what you want from us and what you need from us and where to take us and send us. Yes, you'd be with all those who are grieving. And be a blanket, a heavy, warm blanket over them and bring them comfort. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And let us say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. 
forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
here, my friends, that you are a loved child of God. Hear, my friends, that you are a loved child of God, especially when days are hard. Know that love is with you and share in the name of the Father.